So hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, we have with us Dr. Claire Southington uh, today, who is a doctoral research fellow in the Vitalities Lab Social Policy Research Center and Center for Social Research and Health. Uh, she has been very kind uh, and with her time as well as patience uh, of just coordinating this presentation and making this happen, given the time difference. Uh, so very, very glad that she's here uh, to talk a little bit about her research. Uh, her published research has explored the intersections of social media, privacy, surveillance, and sexuality. Her current research projects are focused on how intimacy and collective effects are cultivated on platforms and with devices and potentials in these spaces for health and sexuality education. Her work has been published in New Media and Society, Social Media Plus Society and Girlhood Studies. Um, and she has been very kind to talk to us about her project within digital ethnography, which some of us might be interested in to explore uh, given the current situation. So thank you very much. Uh, Claire, the forum is all yours. Thank you. Great. Okay. okay. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to come and talk, well, come on Zoom virtually to talk about um, my project. Um, and I really appreciate all of the work that Ekta has put into getting me virtually here because it is always such a um, difficulty navigating the different time zones and everybody's availability. So I really appreciate all of her work putting putting that together. Um, so my talk today is titled Doctors of TikTok, um, what health influencers can teach us about health communication in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's get started. So I wanna give you a bit of an outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. Because TikTok is relatively new as a platform and certainly pretty new as a social research space, I'm gonna give you a bit of a background on the app itself. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a bit about my project and explain why I wanted to analyze TikTok. Um, then I'll give you a bit of an overview of my theoretical framework and I'll talk through my methods and then kind of go through my findings. Um, but I also wanna dedicate a bit of time today to talking about the kind of shift to digital research during COVID-19. Cause I imagine that's something that we're all thinking a little bit about. Um, and I know it's something we are talking a little bit about before we got started. Um, and just offer some advice for scholars looking to take their research online. So my background is really in digital sociology and I've always worked really online and online in online platforms. So I think it's been a really different experience of the pandemic for me. So I wanna kind of see what I can offer for people who are kind of new to this space. So what is TikTok? Um, well, it's in a really interesting context to be talking about TikTok because I believe that at present TikTok is still um, banned in India. So it's a really, um, it's an un unusual place to be kind of talking about it. Um, but TikTok is the international version of, the, of a Chinese app called Douyin. And it's a short form video sharing app, video creating and sharing app. And the videos are really quite short. So they're usually about 15 seconds long, but they can be as short as six seconds and I think the maximum length is a minute, so really very short. Um, important things to know about TikTok is that the demographics, so the, the audience on TikTok is very young. So most people who use TikTok are under 24 and a fair proportion of the users are under 17, so really young users. There's a really strong focus on TikTok on meme making and especially audio memes. So that's where people recreate videos using the sounds from someone else's video. So I've got some gifts here of the interface just to kind of give you a sense of what it looks like. And you can see that it's really oriented around trends. So you can see these hashtags that are kind of different um, hashtags that are trending. And um, there's a real kind of sense of TikToks being oriented towards kind of going viral and tapping into these trends. Another really important part of TikTok is the For You page. So that's the page where in the app, it kind of creates a feed of videos that are specifically for that you. And these are selected by the app's algorithm and that's based on what the, on the past browsing history of that user. And there's been a lot of discussion about this algorithm. It is a proprietary algorithm, so we don't know exactly how it works. Um, but there's a lot of kind of talk about the capacity of the TikTok algorithm to predict what you will like and like how successful it is at doing that. Um, but it's sort of difficult to know exactly how it works, but it does certainly work on what you've interacted with before and trying to guess what you might like. 
And as you can see from the GIFs I've got there, it's a really visual platform, right? So it's not um, a wall of text. It's not, you know, like on Twitter where it's, you know, people um, communicating by text. It's very much visual. And if there is text in the video, it's very rarely the focus of the video. And 2020 was really a big year for TikTok. It, it was outperforming Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all the major social media platforms and topping the, the download charts. So TikTok's popularity has really increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we can really see its popularity peaking in around April 2020. And that's really significant because that's really when the, the kind of global lockdowns were really at their height in a lot of places. And um, in April 2020, TikTok was the most down downloaded social media app on the Google Play Store, which is for um, Android phones and on the Apple App Store. So, and that is a huge increase on their previous year. So it had gone up by two and a half times on the April 2020, uh, April 2019 number of downloads. So really seeing a massive increase um, in people downloading the app, basically during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can also see a huge increase just in the number of, um, of, in the percentage of global internet users who use TikTok. So that jumped from 11% in 2019 to 18% in 2020. So really what this means is that TikTok is shifting from a, a niche kind of social media app that was really for very young people to becoming a mainstream platform. That's really what we're seeing now. So what does this have to do with COVID? Well, I mean, everything kind of has something to do with COVID at the moment. But what I was interested in for my project was about the way that health information circulates on TikTok. And especially around COVID, how does kind of COVID-related health information circulate on, on, on TikTok? And this is really especially timely because we've seen TikTok becoming more and more popular during the pandemic, and health content has also become much more popular on the app during the pandemic. So even before COVID-19, health content was a trend on the app and, it, and, it, and kind of health influences that is like doctors and nurses who were making content were a really significant trend on the app. So like the hashtag doctors of TikTok has over 500 million views. The hashtag nurses of TikTok has 1.5 billion views and the hashtag healthcare worker has over 400 million views. So you can see that these are really popular trends on the app. And the content has only become more popular, accelerated in popularity since both the app has become more popular, but also of course COVID has kind of dominated um, the news and kind of dominated all of our lives. So what does this look like? Let's have a look. These are a couple of um, screenshots of some TikToks that are kind of health focused that I've um, grabbed. Unfortunately, I couldn't grab the whole videos, otherwise my PowerPoint would be enormous. Um, but this should kind of give you a bit of a sense of what it looks like. So the first one that you see, the observing my first surgery TikTok, um, these kind of funny medical stories are a really popular trend on the app. And the, it kind, they kind of tell a story of like a moment, really often a moment of vulnerability for the doctor that kind of cultivates a sense of like the doctors are just like you. Um, it tells this one tells a story of a patient waking up during surgery during this this doctor's first surgery experience, and it uses a really popular audio meme, and the, that kind of heightens the joke. So the joke in the TikTok is the anaesthetist slaps the patient to get them back to sleep, and in the in the kind of caption you can see it says this is a joke. So the doctor is kind of saying like that didn't actually happen, but there's a real sense of like the anxiety and stress of being in your first surgery. Then in the middle, you can see um, Dr. Karan Raj, who is a really popular doctor who creates content on TikTok. And you can see he's got a verified tick, very popular. Um, and he is making a TikTok about, a lot of people have been asking this question, are we gonna wear masks forever? And he's giving you not only his medical opinion, but he's giving you kind of his insider perspective. So the video, he talks straight to camera and um, he's wearing his scrubs and he's clearly in like a medical setting or he may be at home wearing his scrubs, but he's got this kind of like appearance of being in a medical setting. And um, he gives his, his kind of um, take on what he thinks the future will look like with masks. And he really gives this impression that like he's giving you his behind the scenes kind of um, thoughts on this. 
And then on the side, you've got the TikTok baby doc, who's an OBGYN. And in this TikTok, she's reflecting on the like current misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine. Because there's, there's misinformation going around that the COVID-19 vaccine has the potential to impact fertility. So she really highlights that this has been debunked. Um, and she uses a really popular audio meme, like a, a sound clip from a song that says, that's some bullshit, which she mouths in the video. And it's really playful, um, but it conveys a really serious message. So you can see this is the kind of content that you get in health professional kind of TikTok. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of mix. Everything kind of has a, um, like often has a sort of tinge of humor, although not always, some are really serious, but there's definitely a kind of TikTok equality um, to health focused content. To excuse my cat is running around in the background. I apologize for that. <laughs> so there's a there's a lot of play here. We have an emerging health emerging community of health professionals who are making this educational content that's, that's sort of um, entertainment as well, and they're also becoming influencers on um, on TikTok. And at the same time, there's also a really big problem with misinformation that's happening across social media platforms. And that's been a problem during the COVID-19 pandemic since the beginning. So within this kind of context, the World Health Organization has labeled this an infodemic. So that this is kind of like a secondary pandemic that they're fighting alongside the virus. And they define this as an overabundance of information. And that overabundance makes it really difficult to distinguish truth from misinformation. And social media, and TikTok in particular have been called out for allowing misinformation on the app. And a lot of social media companies and um, tech platforms have responded to this public criticism by introducing anti-fake news strategies. So Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok have all introduced these anti-fake news strategies that are in partnership with the World Health Organization. And these are designed to directly um, target misinformation. So you would have seen these if you like, you know, Google anything to do with um, the coronavirus pandemic. If you're on, say, Instagram and you post a picture that um, you that uses words that are related to the pandemic, it might get a little label on it that redirects people to World Health Organization. If you post a tweet that refers to um, COVID-related things, it might appear in other people's feeds along with a, a link back to the World Health Organization. So there's a lot of strategies that have been implemented by these platforms to try and combat misinformation. Even within kind of popular and academic discourse, there's been a real emphasis on this sort of natural synergy between the infodemic and misinformation and social media, sort of as if it's um, inevitable with the sheer scale of communication on social media that misinformation would occur. But there's not a re really been a space for discussing these kind of um, health professionals on TikTok, these people who are um, not necessarily official, official World Health Organization accounts or not necessarily official organizations, but they are health professionals um, sharing information. So I was interested in how we could think about TikTok health content and the creators and analyzing like their community and what this might bring to this debate about the infodemic. Because it seems like their practices of sharing information aren't really being accounted for in this debate. And what I've got a picture of here is just um, some of the key accounts that I analyzed. So you've got Dr. Karan Raj on one side, in the middle, um, Stacey Tanuri, who is a um, OBGYN and then um, a nurse on the other side there, Nurse Hadley. So just to provide a bit of background, I want to explain my theoretical framework a little bit so you can see kind of where I'm coming from. So in this project, I'm drawing on this concept of effect, effective atmospheres. So effective atmospheres refers to the way our capacities are modulated by our environment. And this environment is constituted by humans, non-humans, interfaces, habits, um, in, all in ways that are collective rather than individual. And it's important to know that affect here refers not to emotion in a personal sense, um, as in um, emotion that belongs to an individual, but to a feeling that's more collective. So my approach to thinking about TikToks was oriented towards thinking about their collective elements 
rather than analyzing them in an isolated way. So I wasn't doing a kind of, I wasn't interested in doing a kind of conventional content analysis of each TikTok as a kind of piece of data. Um, instead, I was interested in using this idea of effective atmospheres to think about the way these TikToks are relational in the way that they, they are part of trends um, and they, they have to be made sense of together. They create a sense of something collectively. So um, in order to notice shifts in effective atmospheres, Ben Anderson and James Ash explain that what is needed is a qualitative vocabulary of thresholds and tipping points. So in response to this idea, I sought to develop this qualitative vocabulary. And I did this through a social media ethnography that lasted several months. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that a bit later. And I was also inspired by Highfield and Lever's work on GIFs and Vine clips. I think GIFs and Vine clips give us a really good um, point of reference for analyzing something a bit newer like TikTok. So GIFs being kind of a very short um, looping image and Vine clips being sort of a predecessor to TikTok in many ways, very a uh, platform that shared very short videos. Um, Highfield and Lever argue that these, these forms of media need to be understood as expressive rather than representational. And they emphasize that in many ways they can only be understood through their repetition. So they make sense only because they are short and repetitive. So you have to kind of watch the GIF a couple of times to get it. So sometimes I watched a TikTok over and over to get a sense of it. And this is also, also a common way of viewing TikToks as the app kind of sets up the TikToks to the video to repeat, um, unless you kind of switch to the next one. So I was really interested in what these TikToks um, express, but rather necessarily what they represent. Um, I was interested in, in examining kind of the, the affects and feelings they cultivate in me as the viewer. In addition to attending to these um, atmospheres on TikTok, I also draw a lot on the concept of affordances. So Jenny Davis has done some really great work on, on affordances that I really recommend you reading. You read if you're interested in um, digital technologies at all. Um, but she explains that affordances refer to how objects enable and constrain. So technologies request, demand, encourage, discourage, refuse and allow particular lines of action and social dynamics. So when we're doing research, on um, TikTok or really any social media platform or any digital device, we need to think about how, like what this technology affords and what influences these affordances. So how might search engine optimization, that is the way that platforms like TikTok personalize search results for the user, enable the researcher to find certain types of content and not other types of content. And what about like the layout of the app, the, the app's interface? What buttons are more obvious? Or, um, and that those obvious buttons really encourage and incline users to press those buttons to use those functions. Um, what buttons are much less obvious and therefore those buttons might discourage users from pressing them or, or kind of just make those functions less noticeable and um, kind of obscure their use. We also have to think about things like content moderation and associated algorithmic bias. So what kinds of content would be removed from this platform and wouldn't be visible to the researcher? What kind of practices do creators engage in that might try and resist this content um, moderation? So a really good example on TikTok is that um, many content creators actually purposefully misspell words that are sensitive words that might mean that their content is removed. So for example, depression. Um, if you search for the word depression, you might not find anything, but a lot of content creators will purposefully misspell the word so that they can talk about depression without having their content removed. Similarly, more recently, people have been misspelling the word pandemic in their content so as to not risk having it be removed um, under more recent content moderation that's been attempting to remove misinformation that's kind of been a bit of a blunt instrument and removed a lot of content. So they replace like, you know, letters in the, in the word with like symbols and things like that. So it's still readable to the viewer. You might also want to think about language and accessibility. 
so who can access the content and who can't in terms of like what language is it in and the language of the content that you see is really going to be shaped by the geolocation data that the app reads from your smartphone so what content i see on my tiktok app is going to be very different to the content that someone might see um, somewhere else because i'm located in australia so I'll give you an example of how I might think about affordances looking at a TikTok. So I might be looking at a doctor on TikTok who is a specialist in um, like sexual health and gynecology. And she might be creating TikToks um, and uh, like that are about this topic and kind of being making educational TikToks. And there are lots of topics um, in these TikToks that might um, have her content moderated or removed. And so she's going to be thinking about those, those search terms. She's going to be thinking the affordances of the platform, the content moderation affordances of the platform are really going to be shaping the type of content that um, she produces. So she might make language choices. Um, she might make choices about the kinds of images she uses to ensure that her videos stay up. Um, another way that affordances will shape her content will be things like the interface of TikTok is really oriented towards people replicating others content. So with sections that highlight current trends and the functionality um, in videos, it's very easy to use someone else's sound. So it really encourages you to do that. It really encourages you to make audio memes. Um, so that kind of culture of sharing and replication might encourage her to tap into those trends to give her um, content traction. Then when I'm viewing her videos, the personalization of search results for me will afford specific TikToks appearing in my search results over others. So if I viewed um, and interacted with her videos before, that may encourage me to see more videos from her. And if I viewed a lot of videos using the same audio meme that she uses, um, I'm gonna feel like I kind of get the joke, like I'm gonna be in on the joke that she's making with that audio meme. So I might be more likely to find it funny and enjoyable. And if I haven't watched those videos, I might not really get the joke and I might feel a bit excluded. So there's all these importance of important affordances that create the conditions in which your viewing experience and the platform creators um, TikTok emerge. And it's really important to understand these conditions because it helps paint that rich context from which these TikToks emerge. But I did a social media ethnography and I conducted this over several months in 2020. And social media kind of fits, social media ethnography sort of fits broadly into the larger field of digital ethnography or sometimes called virtual ethnography. And there's a couple of terms um, that are kind of used interchangeably here. Sometimes you may want to use a more specific term if it's more applicable to your research. Um, but there's a really great literature on doing ethnography online. So if you are wanting to do this kind of research, there's lots of resources that can help you design your project. Um, and if you're interested, you can always get in touch with me and I can send you some um, references. I think a really important part of doing social media ethnography um, is understanding the way that social media interactions um, and what we tend to think of as like the digital space are always intertwined with um, the rest of our kind of non-digital lives. And it's, it's really difficult to make those distinctions between digital life and kind of non-digital life. We're always somewhat digitally connected and they're and kind of, you know, there's very rarely fully kind of offline. So it's important to kind of understand the messiness of those distinctions. And as Postel and Pink put it, it's about acknowledging social media as a messy field work environment. Um, and one in, that is constituted through the ethnographer's narrative. So it's really important to think about how doing digital ethnography and really doing any ethnography involves being reflexive about how you as the researcher will shape the story. It's also important to understand that you may have to learn a lot about the digital community that you want to be, that you want to look at before you'll be able to collect your data. Social media practices are learned practices, even though they may feel fun and easy, even though browsing TikTok feels fun, um, they are developed skills. And so you'll have to kind of familiarize yourself with platform cultures and lingo and symbols and um, really prepare yourself to be able to understand and interpret some of the more subtle cues. There's been some really great work that's been done on this. So um, digital anthropologist, Crystal Abaddon's work, 
I think is a really great example of the work that sometimes needs to, that very often needs to be done to kind of really embed yourself in these like digital field work environments. And for me, like a really important part of my project was spending regular time browsing through content that was shared in spaces that I was interested in by health professionals um, in order to kind of understand their sharing practices, to understand like kind of in jokes and the kind of common formats. Um, and it wasn't just about their particular um, communities, but also TikTok more broadly so that I could understand um, specifically what, um, what people were really communicating sometimes when they were kind of using a meme or using like specific references so that I was able to kind of get in on those jokes. So what did I actually do? Um, so I spent a, lot, spent a lot of time doing what I call kind of learning the language. So familiarizing myself with the community and the platform, what were the kind of key hashtags? Um, some people, you know, didn't use those hashtags so kind of how can I um, access those, those parts of the community? Um, and really familiarizing myself with the key players. And of course, I took field, field notes throughout this process to aid my memory, but also to kind of help me reflect um, on my experience and kind of what I thought were the most important um, trends and, and um, how things changed also over time. Um, I traced key influences um, outside the platform. So many of them also had other social media accounts, like either on YouTube or Instagram or on Facebook. And um, by identifying these key accounts, not only did I kind of look at their other social media presence, but I really went deep into their TikTok accounts, looking at um, their whole catalog of videos and looking at how they interact with each other and looking at how they interact with their um, viewers. Um, as well as those key accounts, of course, I looked at a vast number of TikToks that appeared in hashtags and that appeared kind of adjacent to these, um, to these like big key players. Um, of course, this is the traditional sampling and kind of, and um, you can't really kind of get a, a sample when you're doing um, social media ethnography um, because my aim was really more oriented towards getting access to what a viewer might experience on the app. Um, a random sample wouldn't kind of make sense anyway. And given the kind of personalization of, of TikTok search engine, uh, it's not really possible to get a kind of unpersonalized um, sample of TikToks um, in any case. So I'm just gonna have some brief reflections on findings so I can leave time for um, some of the other things I wanna talk about and for your excellent questions. Um, so just some, some reflections. I've found that the platform affordances of TikTok really create the conditions where the meanings of the videos are really interconnected with that meme making um, and the humor and that re like that referential humor. So those, though a lot of these medical professionals were making educational TikToks, like TikToks that were really like informational in style, for elements of them to be understood, you really had to be familiar with TikTok, with the platform trends, with the memes, with the sounds that were kind of circulating um, that people were replicating. I also found that videos, of the video creators often attempt to cultivate intimacy through the videos with their audience. So um, the creator, often like a doctor or a nurse or another kind of health professional, is trying to create a sense of intimacy with their viewer. And they did this using a range of different skills that social media influencers have mobilized a lot over the last decade. So they cultivated kind of a sense of relatability by creating content that highlights kind of moments where they're more of a person than a kind of medical professional. Um, they, they included kind of personal content that was like, you know, um, behind the scenes uh, sort of thing. So creating that sense of intimacy, the sort of everydayness um, on TikTok. And even though many of the, like many of the TikToks were made to look ad hoc and made to look on the fly, sort of made to look as if they were filmed you know, in a car after work or, or in, the, in the doctor's office, um, even if the TikTok creator was, was a sort of very successful influencer. So there was a real sense of needing to create a, a, a kind of um, like everydayness in the content. But the creators also did mobilize their medical expertise. So they weren't just presenting themselves as kind of ordinary individuals. They often appeared in their medical scrubs. They were often wearing stethoscopes um, or like um, other things that kind of signified their professionalism. They often filmed TikToks 
in places that they worked, sort of emphasizing their medical knowledge. And they really, and they really did embed the content that they created in their medical knowledge. So they used both skill sets, their kind of influencer skill set and their medical skill set interchangeably. So the platform affordances that kind of um, incline content towards this sort of meme making, collective affects, humor, these all create the conditions in which content is shared not only on the basis of a health professional's authority to hold this information, but also on their capacity to create a sense of intimacy with their audience. And in these times of kind of profound uncertainty and social change surrounding the pandemic, TikTok health professionals really create that sense of like comfort and closeness and trustworthiness. Like they're giving you health advice as though you're like a close friend. So I wanna also get, um, offer some reflections on this kind of, on doing digital research during COVID. So given my experience as a digital sociologist and someone who's worked mostly in digital spaces, um, I wanted to kind of reflect on this, um, on doing digital research during the pandemic. Um, I'm guessing for a lot of people, COVID has kind of really disrupted their their face to face qualitative research methods, and I think a lot of people are looking for ways to kind of adapt their research and keep going in these tough conditions where face to face is just not an option. Um, I think it's really exciting that a lot of people are thinking about digital methods, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to really um, create some really exciting research, even in kind of quite difficult circumstances, but there are um, a few things I think um, that, that I can offer for people to keep in mind. I think one of the most important things is just to remember that digital methods have a real actually quite a long um, history. So even though we have the sense like digital research methods are quite a new thing, um, I think digital researchers can get a bit grumpy when people think that they can just kind of um, replace a face to face method with a digital research method. Um, without kind of consulting that that kind of history. Um, and there are lots of um, existing scholarship that you can consult, uh, especially you might have to look outside your discipline. That might be something that um, that would be important to do. And I've listed some journals there that could be useful in your media and society, social media and society and the Journal of Social Digital Social Research. Um, but there's just a wealth of, of research that's been done using digital methods but likely um, it's possible that it wouldn't be in your cho in your specific field. So just have a bit of an open mind about where you might have to look for advice um, on how to, to undertake the study that you wanna do. Um, and I think a, a really important thing is to remember that digital methods are kind of more than a stand in for your traditional research methods. And then, so they have like all research methods, they have their kind of own strengths and weaknesses. So doesn't mean that they aren't a great option. I think that digital research methods are, are, very, are really exciting and there's a lot of great possibilities that come from digital research methods. Um, but they ha you have to be kind of clear at the outset about what your research method brings um, and what are things that it's not capable of offering you. So, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit at the beginning that like Zoom, for example, is its, is its own thing. You know, it's kind of very different to meeting someone face-to-face. -face. So there are really clear qualitative differences between talking to someone face-to-face um, -face and talking to someone on Zoom. Um, so for example, you know, on Zoom, someone might be able to very easily send you like a link to in the comments function to something that they found online. So if you were talking to someone about a digital community that they're a part of, actually talking on Zoom makes a lot of sense that they could send you a lot of those um, other digital artifacts that might make sense for your project. And they could also show you, like they could take the, if they were using say a smartphone using Zoom that way, they might be able to take it around their environment and show you some other things. And some people do feel more comfortable on Zoom for some people, especially younger generations. Um, an interview on Zoom might be a lot more appealing than meeting a stranger face-to-face. But at the same time, there are people who are going to be less comfortable. So, you know, some older people might not feel as comfortable doing a Zoom interview. Um, you might be able to, to read people's body language as well. Um, you can only really access the space that they show you. So there are all, there are sort of, that's just an example of how you've got to sort of think through the aspects of your method that um, are shaped by the affordances of the technologies that you're using. Um, and, and just be kind of, 
um, open to to what that lets you do and what doesn't what it won't let you do. So we've got to talk about ethics because I love talking about ethics. <laughs> um, so there's this real, I think, uh, sense sometimes that public social media content is kind of up for grabs. And um, I think a really important thing that researchers that are new to digital research can do is kind of engage really thoughtfully in this space and be careful about digital content. Um, the, the ethics of what you can include in your research um, is much more complex than simply kind of what you can access um, and what's available online. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some tips for thinking through what, what the ethical concerns are if you're doing social media content analysis or kind of content research. So how do we do this thoughtfully? There's luckily there are just um, so many resources out there that you don't have to kind of invent your own protocols. Um, a really good starting place is the Association for Internet Researchers um, guidelines. So I'll leave a link for that at the end. Um, in Australia, we have a national statement on ethical human ethical conduct in human research, um, and they've updated their guidelines to um, offer some in, offer some general advice on social media content analysis and kind of social media um, research ethics. So it's worth checking out if you have national guidelines that might be updated, or if your local um, ethics board has a policy that you can refer to. It's just good to give yourself like um, some kind of bearing so you know um, what might be kind of appropriate in your particular area. But there are some, sort of some general principles that are helpful to keep in mind. Um, I mean, a good principle is just sort of to not assume that because something is publicly accessible, it's intended to be public. So you've got to kind of got to look at the context. And I know that like hearing that you have to look at the context for every single thing, it's like quite annoying, <laughs> but it's unfortunately the case um, that, you know, you might come across a TikTok video that only has, um, you know, 40 views. And even though it's publicly available, it might have very personal content in it. And you would probably be much better off getting the permission of that person to include it in your research or not including it at all. So sort of thinking more carefully about, um, how many people have seen this? And is it possible that my research might expose this person's content to many more people looking at it um, than would be originally intended? I mean, I suppose that's optimistically thinking that a lot of people are accessing our research, which may be um, foolish. So um, in contrast, you might think about someone who has say 600,000 followers, you can reasonably assume that someone in that situation has an intention for their content to be viewed by a broader audience. And, um, and again, context is key. So just evaluating um, if it's safe and appropriate to, to use names, to, to take screenshots, things like that. Um, anonymizing is often a good um, approach, but not always. And I always say kind of, um, don't assume that kind of anonymizing gets you out of, of any ethical problem because, you know, social media content production is a job. And so for a lot of social media influencers, their content is, um, it, it has a monetary value to them and it has, um, it is their kind of, um, their things that it is kind of their art that they've created. So, you know, for, for influencers on TikTok or, pla or platforms like YouTube or Instagram, it may be appropriate to actually give attribution so that, you're properly acknowledging who has created this content. And I think that overall, um, conducting ethical research is really an ongoing process. So once you've kind of um, decided how you're gonna approach particular um, issues, it's not kind of resolved for the rest of the project, but really it's an ongoing process of thinking about privacy and ethics carefully um, throughout your data collection, but also when you're writing up, you know, thinking about when you're writing up your data, Am I doing justice to my participants? And, you know, being generous to them and the content that they've created, you know, content is labor um, and you've got to be respectful to um, what someone has made and put their time into making. So I've just got a few references here um, that I think could hopefully be helpful if you're interested in following them up, but also feel free to email me. Um, I've got my Twitter there if you want to tweet at me. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, this is Bindu. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi. Thank you for a very nice and interesting presentation. Um, I had a question about, uh, you said you can't really talk about the sample size. And I noticed that your findings were very qualitative in nature, uh, which means that you probably had to go through each of these videos to sort of come to your findings. Um, uh, and to be able to come to such findings, how many of these memes or these videos had you did you need to go through is um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, it's it's very difficult to quantify because you watch like honestly hundreds of them. <laughs> that makes me sound like I'm just like stuck to TikTok all the time, which is kind of true. Um, but you know, I I did this digital ethnography over from basically March last year to November. Um, so you can imagine if you know I would kind of do a viewing session um, like usually about once a week and kind of um, view lots of TikToks at a time. And TikTok is kind of encourages people to view a lot of TikToks. It's really what they want. Um, so because it is a qualitative study, um, I don't like quantify the um, the number of TikToks I view much more try and get a sense of like what is the environment that I'm that I'm in um, and what are the kind of like getting a sense of things rather than like um, trying to to decide discern what like an appropriate sample size is I guess um, but yeah you do look at just like hundreds of TikToks and some you know you sit and watch like 10 times and some you watch like once and you sort of you know have a sense of it so they're really varied and you know it's really strange when I look back at my notes there's some accounts that I've written like heat pages of notes about and then some TikToks that really don't stick with you very much so I think um, the value of the approach is that it allows you to kind of um, more holistically capture those differences because as a viewer you know um, I think a lot of people who've been on TikTok will have that sense of like some TikToks really stick in your mind and others kind of slip back into the, the feed and you'd kind of forget about them so I hope that answers your question um, but yeah I've in terms of numbers I viewed I would say way too many yeah so I know I was just wondering uh, for this kind of social media research which is qualitative um, are there any other, are there any methods you used to sort of, um, you know, pass through so such a large volume for a qualitative research? Because um, I've, my research is on teacher communities of practice, online oh, teacher cool. communities of practice yeah. on, on a Telegram mobile messaging app. Oh, cool. And um, again, it was just the a sheer volume of the messages that I had mm. to go through. And yeah qualitatively uh, sort of code them. So I was just wondering, um, are there any methods that you've used to sort of cope with this, this mm. kind of qualitative coding, but a large volume? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for um, a more, I, I think in a, in a case like that, one thing that could be beneficial is to kind of really see um, when you get to saturation point, like when you feel like you're not coming across new themes, in your data that could be a good way to bypass like the having to sift through hundreds of um of you know individual pieces of content so on a pre on another project that i worked on we ended up with a sample actually like looking at a sample of tiktoks rather than doing um only digital ethnography and um in that case we more were looking at like um, how many TikToks were we looking through until we felt like we'd kind of re reached a saturation of themes and that might be a more appropriate way for your project because I think when you're looking at a really specific thing um, you know you when you're looking through content you naturally get to a point where you think I'm seeing the same kind of things just sort of like when you you know when you're doing an, an interview project and you interview say 25 people and you think actually now I'm just getting sort of similar things in the interviews I think you can apply the same principle to social media content analysis and think you know at what point am I just seeing the same things thank you thank you so much um yeah I mean thanks uh, Claire for that uh, very interesting presentation uh, we do have questions coming up. I just have one question before I take up the one that's, I think, in the chat. Um, what 
I was wondering about the medical practitioner's video that you had taken up for your research project. I was wondering whether TikTok also has this uh, feature where uh, influencers get paid for their content. Um, and the famous ones that you highlighted in your research, was there also a way for them to make money through their content? And how does that yeah. conflict, conflict with the idea of uh, research and what content they create? Because I'm guessing that has to be very user oriented in that sense. Yeah, that's a really great question. The monetization of content on TikTok is relatively new. Um, on on Douyin, on the Chinese app, it's much more sophisticated and there's a lot of revenue streams for creators. On TikTok, largely, if content creators want to make money, they need to redirect people to other platforms. So um, they need to get them onto their YouTube channel where they can make money from advertising revenue um, or they need to get them um, to like onto some other way of making money. So either they can sell a product um, or they can, they have to have some kind of um, other way of making money. There is now an influencer, like TikTok kind of um, influencer program um, that does have, as far as I'm aware, some financial benefit, but largely I think the biggest way that influencers make money is still off platform. Um, and it isn't, it's an interesting problem because I think for medical professionals, they have, they largely have a job. <laughs> they have a, like a, you know, a paid job. And if in some places, I think it's considered a conflict of interest. Um, I mean, in the States, where a lot of the influencers are, I don't think it is because doctors already have some professional like blurred lines around products. Like, so some doctors will accept, um, you know, some money for different, for, you know, from different companies and things like that. It's not unheard of, but in other jurisdictions, certainly, and I think in the UK, it's not considered acceptable for doctors to receive um, income from like other services. So they have to kind of be careful about that it is a real gray area. And it's a great question. Um, it's not something I've been explored in depth, but I think it's a real serious issue for these creators. Does that become a lot of, does that mean that a lot of content becomes homogenized because of the kind of um, traction a certain kind of uh, video or content gets where everybody sort of imitates that, which has become the case on so more social media. In fact, there are jobs that people have now to uh, you know, make this so-called viral yeah. and other things. And so this theoretical framework and stuff that we create for our research uh, then makes it difficult for it to analyze it for that kind of content because it's all based on monetization in that sense. Yeah, I think, I, mean, I think on TikTok we're seeing that they're kind of at the precipice of that about to happen. It's a really interesting time that um, I don't think they've fully professionalized um, the platform yet, but I think you're absolutely right. I think it's it's very much happening and you already do see a lot of content being very streamlined. There's still a preference, I think, on the site for people to see content that feels like homemade. Um, but I would say we're very much reaching the end of that point. You know, I think it's very much going the direction that YouTube went, which was towards, you know, professionalized content. Um, and I mean, there are still doctors who make YouTube content and that's still a really successful space. Um, but, you know, making a professional YouTube video is much more time consuming than filming a TikTok on your phone. So that will really shape the kind of content and the kind of producers that we see. So I think over the next couple of years, the kind of content that is in this kind of community is really going to change and that's going to be very interesting to watch. Sure, thanks. Um, Sharon has a question in the chat and uh, if you'd like to read that and respond. Uh, she says, you mentioned that one needs to know the language to understand most TikTok videos. How do you establish this? How do you ensure that it isn't just a bias or personal experience? Wasn't coloring this uh, inference? Yeah. Um, so the language is something that you kind of um, acquire throughout the, the process of the digital ethnography. And absolutely, I mean, personal bias, there's no, I think there's no way to remove personal bias from qualitative research um, at, like, at all. So there's absolutely elements of, of um, personal bias and my own positionality in the research. Um, but part of the process of, of getting to know the language of the TikToks is really things like getting to see which hashtags are used, um, getting to see which audio memes are popular, getting to see what style of video um, is popular. And some of that can be achieved just by looking at the most popular accounts and the videos that circulate often. Um, but of course, some of that is going to be skewed by my own, um, by like which videos are presented to me as a, re as like an individual user. 
Um, and I think that there's like a, yeah, there's, there's kind of really given the structure of TikTok very little way to avoid that personalization. But I think there are some um, general things that can be gleaned from that in terms of like the, the tools that, that creators use, the different kind of meme making styles that they use. But yeah, absolutely. I think that there's no way to kind of remove personal bias from that. Uh, Ananya is asking whether you verified the accuracy of the content that some of these medical professionals were, uh, you know, propagating in their videos, um, and uh, what what do you think? You know, if they could respond to that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, for the purpose of this uh, research project, I was looking mostly at their styles of communication, so I wasn't looking at um, whether they were sharing like you know whether the content that they were sharing was like factually accurate although I would say largely based on the stuff that I saw there were the content was of such a nature that it was um it was really like it was really necessary to to um fact check given that it was often things like you should wash your hands you know it was sort of general the health information was very was usually very broad um but because my interest was primarily in their kind of communication strategies um it wasn't something that i was that was part of this project but it is something that i think would be interesting to look at in a future project to look at the kind of difference yeah whether there's kind of even even small differences in kind of what is fact like whether they are um circulating even minor misinformation um, cause of course, you know, there's, there's disagreement in the medical community about different things. Like I know in the early days of the pandemic, the world health organization didn't support the widespread wearing of masks. And then that's changed, you know, so even to see whether there is some kind of circulating of different, different opinions, but definitely the medical information is, is very, um, kind of gen, I would say common sense in some ways, like, um, yeah, it tends to be things like you should wear a mask that's about COVID or you should, um, wash your hands so things in many ways replicating the information that is circulated by the world health organization um, or sometimes it'll be just things like you know um like how much water should you drink so very very kind of general um and and only a few accounts are successful spreading very specific health advice and i think that's an interesting thing in and of itself um that people aren't particularly thrilled by the idea of hearing like the real details of medical um, information and research yeah, only in uh, I think the series like House and other things I guess where there is <laughs> uh, another uh, question Claire that I had was that um, how do you plan for a research of this nature where you're looking through so much content and you're discarding things and um, I mean storage and planning of research of this is massive yeah. and also I think ethical concerns for those are also important you can't just store everything and Google Drive and so what what are the ways that one could plan for something like yeah, I, I mean, it, I think these projects are extraordinarily difficult to plan because, um, you know, when I first started looking at TikTok, it was pre-COVID and, um, you know, then, of course, a lot of the <laughs> trends really significantly change. And also, you know, um, as we've seen, TikTok can be banned in certain places. So you may <laughs> be looking at an app and then it's no longer available in your country. And I think so th certainly the idea that digital research is like um, easy and accessible is not always the case. Certainly with this project, I think what helped me plan was I, you know, kept a lot of notes really about the process that I was going through. Um, I, like I did have a function for, um, I did have a process for saving the URL. So TikToks have a um, identify, like a URL that's identifiable. I did have a process for saving certain TikToks that were particularly significant. Um, but again, I did it with certain ethics in mind, like I never saved the URL for TikToks that I didn't feel would be appropriate to include in research findings. Um, and yeah, I think that there's kind of, there's a lot of things to, to, to think about in terms of these projects take up a lot of your time. Um, and it's sort of, I think one thing that I would do differently is sort of when I planned it out originally, I guess I had this like foolish idea that it would be a pretty like low time <laughs> consuming. Like I was like, oh, it'll just looking at TikToks, so how fun. Um, but it did take an enormous amount of time and it took up, um, yeah, it, it was, the, it takes a lot of time to maintain a sense like you can't just sort of drop the project for a month if you get busy because these things change so much so it did take a lot of time to be able to 
keep up with the because the content circulation is so rapid like one week I would look at it and you know the top videos were all World Health Organization videos because the there was a policy in place where TikTok was trying to promote those videos and within a week they were all dropped from the search results because they weren't popular enough and so you know you think you're kind of on top of it and you really have to be constantly checking if you're trying to sustain an engagement with the community so it, it is a challenge and it's, you know, this is certainly not, there were so many things that I would change about the project having done it now. So it's certainly not a, a perfect um, outcome, but it was a really interesting and fun experiment. And I would, you know, would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, please do type in your questions or just unmute yourself and uh, voice them directly. And I'd love to hear about any research that anybody is thinking of doing. Like, you know, if anyone's got projects on them in their mind. Sorry, I think I lost you for a minute. Claire, could you please repeat that? If anyone has any projects that they're thinking of, um, of undertaking, I'd be very happy to hear about them. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi, hi, uh, Claire. This is Lakshman, uh, research scholar in this. Uh, so my research proposal is uh, uh, development of professional uh, development of language assessment literacy among uh, English teachers community. And now, actually, I am planning to conduct some <coughs> participatory action research uh, where uh, uh, teachers uh, I need to work with a group of teachers. And because of uh, this pandemic, I am unable to conduct some face-to-face -face sessions with them. So what, uh, uh, what kind of care should I take while conducting Zoom or any online um, uh, okay, class or face sessions? So how can I store? Can you uh, guide me? Sure. So you said you were going to do Zoom interviews, is that right? Yes, Zoom interviews. Yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, I think Zoom is a is a really great option when you're planning a, a you were going to do it like a face-to-face -face interview and then zoom um, becomes your your like option in the COVID situation we had a project in our lab that we did a similar thing we were going to do face-to-face -face interviews um, I think some things to think about is like what fam how familiar are the people that you're going to be interviewing like how familiar are they with zoom like um, for some, like for some people, we've been interviewing. They're really familiar with it because they work in an office and they Zoom all the time now. And then other people we interviewed just like they did work where they didn't have to Zoom, like do Zoom meetings. And so it was really varied. Um, and so that was something we really need to think about: is like what is the literacy? Like how familiar are your or participants with Zoom? And what kind of um, information and tools will you have to provide them with so that it's going to be comfortable? Um, so we had to provide, we, like we gave people really detailed steps on like how to, you know, do different functions and, and how to install different things. And, and that was really important um, to also just as, a, as something to factor in, like if someone's never used it before, they may be less comfortable than someone who's used it all the time. Um, if, if people are using it all the time, um, then you also do have to factor in things like maybe they're going to be really sick of using it and they're going to be like, so it's possible that, you know, it could be an additional um, burden in like their day. And so thinking about how you might schedule the interview sensitively to that, um, it, you know, all these kind of unusual things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but can be a real factor and we certainly had to think about that um, in the lab when we had Zoom interviews, sort of just checking in with people that we weren't scheduling a Zoom interview at the end of a day when they'd had like 10 Zooms that day. <laughs> so, um, and also I think just thinking about what are the elements of a face-to-face -face interview that you're not gonna be getting? Um, and is that gonna impact your project? And could you think about other ways to access that information? So if you're, if, if you're trying to get a sense of, um, someone's body language or if you're trying to get a sense of someone's environment could you ask them to um, describe certain things to you or could you get them to show you using the camera so think a little bit creatively about um, what you might be missing but also what you might be gaining with zoom and how you could use it 
that way, I guess would be my advice. Um, and also uh, one difficulty you have with Zoom is when you record the videos, they are really large files. <laughs> so that's just another thing to factor in when you're recording um, Zoom, like video interviews, you end up with an enormous number of large files. So just factoring, factoring in things like file storage is um, another thing to think about. Okay, uh, thank you, Claire. Thanks a lot. Uh... Um, hi, Claire. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So um, I've been kind of struggling with um, an alternate methodology per se. So what I'm trying to look at in my research um, is essentially the edtech market. And I'm kind of taking uh, case studies and interviewing founders of specific uh, programs. Mm -hmm. But then in some sense, I have also been feeling like looking at these webinars and following uh, a number of these webinars that are held for um, people from the industry to come and just talk about these things. And mm -hmm. also kind of looking at the LinkedIn profile of all of these founders. I've always been feeling like there's a certain pattern or a certain language that they use to talk about education um, mm. and uh, the process of learning itself. So when I'm trying to kind of trace this, um, I, I don't know how to kind of look at it. In some sense, I would call it a digital ethnography, but it's also not. So do you have any suggestions as to what kind of methodology I can probably look at it? Yeah, that's a, that sounds like a really interesting project. And it kind of sounds like, I think you're right, it doesn't sound like a digital ethnography as such. It kind of sounds like you're doing like a discourse analysis in a way of the kind of, like, a, yeah, of the language that they use um, and of the way they kind of construct their personas. Um, so it really does sound like it could be like a digital discourse analysis um, of, of the kind of materials that they put online about themselves. Um, and that could be a really great way to kind of complement any other, like if you were doing interviews with them, you know, people often present themselves one way in an interview and then present themselves a really different way in other contexts. And I think if, you, if you're getting a sense of this really interesting language and the way that they construct themselves online, it could be really, really great to do a discourse analysis of, of that stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that sounds fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think one of the questions that Bindu asked with regard to how much content do you need to cite through in order to get your data that you actually need, I think uh, that's a concern that uh, professors in the center, or this is a question, question regularly asked to doctoral students uh, in mm -hmm. the center. And, uh, and I know there is no right or wrong answer to it, but at the same time, how could one respond to it confidently enough uh, for everybody to feel safe, for students to let pursue something like this if something like this uh, is not the norm in the center. Um, yeah. So. yeah, that is really <laughs> hard, I think, because, um, yeah, because it, when you're doing, um, yeah, I think when you're doing non-traditional research, there's so many, like there's a lot of um, more traditional ways of thinking about data that kind of get in the way a little bit and I think that it's sometimes more it's sometimes difficult to convince people um, that this that you've got an, an adequate um, sample or that your data is is um, is suitable for what you're trying to do and it is much harder when you're not in a um, in a school that has a lot of digital research and it's much harder when you're not um, surrounded by people who are doing similar projects I think in that situation a good thing to do would be to try and um, use existing literature and existing projects to show that the method that you're using is is actually you know even though it may seem experimental in your discipline very much the standard approach in other disciplines and in media studies um, and in digital media studies especially these methods are now you know the traditional research methods and so I think you could certainly point to those research studies and those disciplines to establish that, you know, um, the places where these methods were developed, there are um, established standards that you can adhere to that don't include meeting a certain criteria of number of videos that you have to watch, you know, there, that there are like certainly people who have published very, very well respected research that doesn't um, 
have to meet those standards. So it is, it's very difficult. I know when I was doing my PhD, whenever people would be like, you can be creative, I'd be like, no, I can't because I have to graduate and like, leave me alone. Um, but, you know, I do think that if you do want to pursue something like that, that the best thing you can do is show that um, really well-respected scholars in fields that have developed these methods are um, adhering to the standards that you are presenting. Thanks a lot. So yeah, I don't think there are any more questions. A lot of them were answered uh, quite uh, in detail. So thanks a lot, Claire, uh, for such an interesting presentation, as well as taking the time to answer all our questions. Um, and hopefully, we can interact with you again at some point uh, with the interesting research that you keep doing and uh, you know sharing in public as well. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks, everyone.